Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Gina Totaro, and I am the Events Engagement Manager at the International Sculpture Center. I just want to welcome you all to our first encounter of the Voices on Community Through Time and Space series. Uh, we're very excited um, to be starting the series with this amazing panel today. So just a little housekeeping for the first half of the session, we'll have a presentation from our panelists. Um, and during the presentation, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute. Um, and if you wanna also shut off your video. And also after the presentation, we're gonna have a live Q&A session um, where you're gonna be able to ask our panelists questions or share your feedback. So for the Q&A um, today, we're gonna to be utilizing the chat feature so you can feel free to type your question in the chat at any time during the presentation or during the Q&A. Um, and we'll hopefully get to, to everybody's question um, during that session. Uh, so with that, I am gonna pass things over to the ISC Executive Director, Johanna Hutchinson. Thank you, Gina. And I'd just like to start by saying thank you for, to Gina for working so hard to get this panel together. And thank you to all the panelists in advance. They are on the other side of the world and it's very early for them. So we really appreciate um, them dialing in. And um, I see a lot of people don't have their video up and I know it's because it's very, very early for you. So uh, thank you for dialing in. It's truly an international event, an international conversation. Um, as Gina said, this is our, inaug our inaugural um, encounter and is part of a year long series. So it will be, I believe on the second Thursday of every month. So make sure that you attend the others. Um, this is free. So please get as many people as you can to attend um, and just be inspired and share your thoughts and put your questions in the chat. Um, with that, I think we'll start with our programming. Thank you everybody. Hi everyone, I'm Gilbert and I'm very excited to be part of this thought leadership for the Sculpture Conference. We are very excited to talk about a very important topic nowadays, wherein how can we are sustainable. Our topic is called Artwork Ingredients List. How do we create a tool for responsible consumption and production in the arts? Before I start, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we are all meeting today. Some of the panel members that we uh, have this um, today would calling in from Brisbane, Australia and in Byron Bay, New South Wales. I myself, I am, uh, want to pay respect to the owners and early settlers here in Cold Spring in New York. It's like the Sioux, Crows and Blackfeet who dominated the Northern Cape. I pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and also to all First Nations, um, to where everyone, everyone who's listening to this um, thought leadership today. Um, th there will be two parts in this um, pre-recording. We would have myself talking to an amazing panelist. But before that, um, before I make that, those introductions, I just wanna start with really the theme for today. We all know that Sustainable Development Goal 12, a responsible consumption and production, is a goal that argues for achieving economic growth while reducing ecological footprint, changing the production and consumption methods, and really encouraging the closing of the loop. We know for a fact that the idea of reduce, reuse, and recycle was a, was a very good concept, but has changed over the years, and we want to start reliving and 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 using those concepts again. Um, the, the SDG for responsible um, production and consumption has always been a, 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 a problem. So what you're seeing here is actually an ingredient label where um, it's common for other products um, like clothing or food or medicine, but it's actually not in other um, uh, pieces of or other things, especially the artwork. 
we think that it's an opportunity for the art to start invest, um, investigating this and really digging upon what's the benefit of that um, because it can definitely uh, help us understand what are the inputs and uh, onto a product or any artwork and most importantly it gives a sense of transparency and for us to really learn um, um, moving forward so the idea of our green ingredients list started with project one earth with uap when we partnered with griffith business school and griffith university with professor snick and um, chris um, from that university, and it basically helped us to interrogate what are the key sustainable development goals for UAP. And from there, we were able to um, come up with the artwork ingredients list. Part of the artwork ingredients list, which you can um, get to know more after the co uh, conversation, is for us to creating different stages, like establishing boundaries, developing a framework, and creating the actual ingredients list, which we would be discussing further for today. And a good thing is we were very lucky to have um, a, a very influential artist in the lead to start really working with us in this journey to how to create a carbon neutral sculpture and in the future become a climate positive, um, uh, uh, climate positive um, artworks. We were able to start looking at what are the different um, materials that go on to the to the product, and from that we will be able to create an artwork, and we will be able to understand how we can reduce, how we can reuse, or how can we even investigate recycled um, products to an artwork. And from there, it even really um, interrogates energy use, the transportation, and at the end, we were able to create a symbolism or like what are the actual summary of the carbon emissions. And, and um, uh, one recent project for Lindy Lee, we were able to understand that producing the artwork equals to producing a, uh, an example of like one um, top of the line Land Rover or two and a half um, Ford sedan. So having those concept, concepts and context are very helpful for us moving forward. So with that, I want to um, uh, introduce the actual panel discussion. I hope you like this. Um, please stay tuned. There would be an actual Q&A after the pre-recording. So thank you. Um, we have with us today, I'm very um, excited to be speaking to Lindy Lee, um, one of Australia's most famous contemporary artists. Um, Lindy's practice explores her Chinese ancestry to Taoism and Zen Buddhism, philosophies that see humanity and nature as, in, um, as linked, which is beautiful for any sustainability story about this interlink about humanity and nature. Um, Lindy's born in Brisbane and living in, in Byron. Lindy, Lindy's work um, encompasses painting, multimedia installation, sculpture, major public art commissions, and represented in major public and corporate collections all over the world. In 2021, she held a major survey exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art titled Lindy Lee, Moon in a Dewdrop, and most recently commissioned by the National Gallery of Australia to deliver the gallery's first new major piece and first Australian a more sustainable works of art in the outdoor sculpture garden in a decade. Um, so thanks, Lindy, for, for being part of today's um, call. Yes. And we also have, um, I want to happy to introduce also Professor Snick Barter and Professor Chris Fleming, who has been very instrumental to UAP's journey um, on One Earth. So we created One Earth and it's very important for us to have this sounding boards. And I think we, we use Nick and Chris as our sounding board. And I'm sure they were very patient with us as we started this journey. So Professor Nick Barter is a professor of strategy and sustainability. His core purpose is to help executives develop their sustainable mindset and begin the journey of transforming their organizations to become future normal. Um, Nick, leads um, the Univ Griffith University's online presence and has a deep understanding on the triad of technology, education, and sustainability and organizational strategy. 
Prior to the academia, Nick was a senior executive in, in industry and a strategy consultant for Ernst & Young. So Nick, thank you. And um, obviously, um, last but not least, we have Professor Chris Fleming. He's a professor of economics who teaches, researches, consults, and provides public policy advice on the economic determinants of well-being and the sustainable management of the world um, around us. Um, Nick, uh, Chris's expertise in climate change, um, economics and policy, uh, it makes him also the head of research for Griffith University's Climate Action Beacon and leads a range of projects helping Pacific Island nations adapt to climate change. Um, Nick and Chris is part of um, uh, 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 an offering when, when and in helping organizations like UAP to become future normal. We're in um, helping organizations to become fit for the challenges of the 21st century. So I'm very excited for um, uh, the three of you here and very lucky actually. Um, we're all, we're in different time zones um, <laughs> in New York and, and I'm sure in a different situation, we would be sitting together in, 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 in one room, but we'll make this work today. Um, I just think maybe I just want to start first um, with asking Lindy, and I think it's about because a lot of this discussion really revolves on a, a, a creative vision and the artist vision and influence. So, um, Lindy, if, if it would be great for us to you to give us an idea and really understanding your practice. Um, my introduction to you about the um, the humanity and nature is actually very sustainability focused about this interlink. So. We would love to hear more about that and and really uh, talk about your your creative um, influences. Oh, thanks, Gilbert, and it's so wonderful to uh, be talking with Nick and Chris about this incredible topic. Um, you know, my work has only ever been driven by one question, and that is, where do I fit in? You know, it it basically comes out from this. It's it's a simple question of belonging, how we belong. It comes from me being born in Queensland, which is predominantly white culture in the 50s, 60s and 70s. This face, very Chinese. So all of my work has been about the schism between ancestry and birthplace. So that's how it began. And this is some 40 years ago uh, when I first started as an artist. But as it evolved, these questions of identity just e expanded into questions of um, cosmos, you know, because because mm. in Zen and in 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 Taoism, we you know the, the 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 structure of that those philosophies is that we can never step outside nature. We can do stuff. We can invent aeroplanes and we can do remarkable things using the laws of nature. And our conceit has been that we therefore command nature, but we can't. We're absolutely interdependent. So pretty much all of my work is about humanity's absolute interconnection with nature and cosmos. We cannot step outside of this matrix. Mm. So and that's the will of my so the will of my work is very inclusive. So that's that's the first thing. And then the next, sorry, the second, the most related to our topic is because. Uh, I'm so concerned about the intimacy of this connection. It's really important to also have respect for nature and the sustainability question becomes a really important one. So it's not it's, it's completely about the art, but also the way we make things and our, our uh, responsibilities towards those. So there's a, it, it, there's a very beautiful connection, I think, between the idea of sustainability and the prospect that my work offers. That's that's a, that's a beautiful way of really starting this conversation, Lydia. And I think that really frames how this conversation is. And um, without, uh, like, we we talked about our Boris with the National Gallery Commission. How did that happen? Like, what was the evolution of the idea of of the National Gallery Commission? Because a lot of it is really, again, the interconnection. It's about this infinity, about um, humanity and, and the cosmos also. It would be good to also understand that. Yeah. Um, Nick Mitsovich, who is the director of the NGA, he had also worked with me on another project when he was director of South Australian uh, National no, Museum. Anyway, um, 
and somehow, you know, he's he's just been on with me, encouraging me on this journey. And then he simply, um, the anniversary is coming up, the 40th anniversary of the NGA is coming up. And he just said, Lindy, we want you to be as ambitious as possible. You know, what is what is what can you do? And so I started to think it through and I just do you want me big and I've started getting big and so this will be an Ouroboros okay so and it the Ouroboros is the snake that swallows its own tail and this symbol is a very very ancient symbol and it's transcultural and it crosses time and millennia Mm. and pretty much I figure any culture any human society that's encountered snakes snakes become part of the mythology so the snake swallowing its own tail was apparently first found in King Tutankhamun's tomb thousands of years ago, um, but it's appeared in, in many, many cultures. And that snake eating its tail is the the uh, symbol of eternal return, of, of, of the cycles of birth and death. And again, that kind of relates to sustainability because it's sort of like, we have to uh, we have to respect these cycles, and these cycles also include regeneration, you know, and that's really important. So the sustainability part is also addressing, uh, uh, you know, that responsibility. Yeah, that's it's it's a it's a, it's a very interesting mm. because I we always uh, think about sustainability, and I'm sure Nick and Chris would would respond to this quite well about this. Um, the circles of this interrelated circles, which is a story. And I know, Lindy, a lot of your work from the life of stars, there's this a lot of like interconnected circles were part of one whole. And, and that's one of the core things. So Nick, Chris, um, uh, uh, I think the question that I wanted to ask for, from you is, um, how did this, because I know it, the conversation of an artwork ingredient list came about as part of, 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 of the journey of UAP. Um, wh- what was the origin story of it actually, if there is one? Uh, it would be good to understand how did it start? Well, I wanna pick up on a few things, Lindy, as she right. said, which was um, one of the things she, she said was about fitting in and also ambition and um, notions of being able to step outside nature. And one of the things I think that that drove me and Chris in the direction of travel that our own journeys have taken us is because we were we were continually amazed, I think, by the lack of ambition of organizations, the lack of ambition of organizations mm-hmm. to do something that is truly groundbreaking in terms of helping lift um, humanity in towards more sustainable outcomes. And what then comes underneath that? particularly is um, the fallacies of command and control, the fallacies of misplaced concreteness around how somehow we can control nature, we can step outside nature, which is another point that Lindy was making. And one of the things our work has been doing and continues to try and do is to try and actually kind of blow away that idea of separation and recognize the intimate connection of everything to everything else. And then for me, as Lindy was talking, that brings in all the ideas that Lindy was talking about there about our links to the wider cosmos, our links to our surroundings, et cetera. And that's encapsulated in what we try and do when we work with organizations is to, is to try and get them to blow away those notions of boundaries and then start to see the organization as a vehicle of change to help lift us into more sustainable outcomes where those sustainable outcomes cut across treading on you know, our impact around on our surroundings is, is lighter, our impact on our communities are lighter and uplifting, etc. And then it's from there that we really got into the idea of the ingredient list, as you say, is, 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 a, is a very simple one, because you we all know what it's like to pick up an ingredient, uh, something from the supermarket and read the ingredients and get a sense. But we also know that ingredient list is hides a lot of truths as well. And so what we're trying to do with the ingredient list um, and our work with you is bring forward a much fuller and a much rounder understanding of the cost of something in terms of not just the 
we're not getting at the price of something here, but the cost of something to our surroundings, the cost of something to our earth to actually produce something. So we can actually start to get a much better sense of it costs this much in carbon for sure, but it costs this much in water. This and, and where you want these things to go ultimately is to say this is how much of the earth was given up, you know, uh, be it whatever that may be, in order for this thing to be here in front of us. Mm. And so that's that's the basic idea, but it comes, the thought processes are very similar to the, the ones that Lindy was highlighting, mm. to how we ended up here. We, we've gone through similar dynamics of thought around lack of separation, about organizations not being ambitious enough. Do you want to add anything? Chris? Yeah, look, I think the, the ambition story really, really spoke to our oh. journey because we're both professors in a business school and, and, and business theory has has been astonishingly um, low on on the ambition front. Where, you know, businesses or organisations have been reduced to only caring about profit, uh, at least in the theory, and and that's that's incredibly simplistic, uh, and not even true, not realistic. If you if you speak to people who who run or own or have formed organisations, you know that they do want the organisations to achieve more than than just make money. Um, but business theory hasn't reflected that. So one of the things I guess we've noted uh, teaching in business schools over the years is, is that people do have ambition for their organisations, but don't necessarily have the tools to realise those. Mm. And so this future normal journey for us has been about helping organisations, and, and I guess in particular UAP, realise the ambitions it had just didn't know how to, to, to make come true. Yeah. And that's interesting because Lindy, you're also taught like you are. You've taught a lot of of, of art students, um, and and it's it's interesting. Like, um, has there been for you as someone who is actively practicing um, uh, and in doing art, and also having some a team under you and you're mentoring? What do you think this journey is like um, um, moving forward? Because uh, this commission for the NGA is quite significant. The story of the of the of your practice and how it's going to be made is is going to be significant. Has there been um, a change or of or, or anything in, that will be something that will be um, taken forward from this? Um, how how are you seeing it move forward? Oh, so many questions in that, uh, Gilbert. I just uh, the first thing. Yeah. The first thing I was thinking just when I was teaching, I used to teach at um, University of Sydney. Um, is and especially in my postgrad, my graduate supervision, um, sustainability and actually the use of and materials because artists always, we don't always use brand new materials. Often, I had so many students, absolutely invested in the idea of recycling. So all of their work, they, you know, I had one student who's who's major PhD, uh, you know, it was it was about using uh, basically rubbish um, mm. to create from. Um, so that's that's it's just, I've just noticed that as a groundswell during my teaching that it's not something that I've been trying to say we should be thinking about in terms of art, but it's something that's naturally been growing out of the grassroots of the student population meaning of the work, which is about inclusiveness, you know, and one strand of that is actually sustainability. It's actually sort of not yeah. just being a conceit that, yes, we, I believe, yeah, I believe in inclusiveness. I believe in, you know, blah, 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 yeah. to actually make an action out of it. So I'm really excited about that. So it, it, it puts proper value on what we're trying to achieve. We're really, you know, taking this um, mm. sincerely, you know, it's good. So I, yeah. I'm imagining because this is the first time we really considered it absolutely and and folded it into the making of these immense sculptures yeah you know it's just it'll it'll pave the way for others because if we can do it why can't others do it you know it's as simple as that really that, that, and that's 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 been very exciting to hear and and that's exactly what um uh the thought is like it, it, it would create some ripple effect i remember chris we were chatting before about um, uh, the CFOs, the CFOs of the four, all only think about the dollars, right? And 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 I asked you, but most of these CFOs have been trained um, by their peers, and they don't think about sustainability. So how do we do it? 
it's by changing one CFO at a time. So I think for this one, it feels like what we're hoping to do is we change one manufacturer at a time. We change one um, um, art foundry at a time. And, and because for us, it's all about how do we create this triple effect, which is actually um, very uh, uh, interesting. And I guess I wanted to ask like Nick, Chris, from, from your experience on sustainability, what would be is the biggest challenge or hurdle for any organization who is going to do similar um, um, initiatives of what, what do you think would be uh, a, an obstacle for them? Look, I think the biggest challenge and, and the place to start is with mindset, is, is to, to change the way key people within the organization view the purpose of the organization and, and, um, and, and bring the sustainability to the fore because it is so easy just to do the same thing that you did yesterday, today, tomorrow, and, and so on. So you can get trapped in that inertia of, of not, not changing. But I think inherently, and we're seeing it with our students increasingly, people realise that the, the models that might have worked in the middle of last century are no longer suitable for, for where we are now. And so people will have this innate understanding that, you know, things need to change, the way organisations operate need to change. And so it's there. It's just a matter of, of giving confidence. I think that's another really important um, aspect of what we try and do because people want to make the change. They don't know how and, and they're scared to take that first step. So really it's about people, it's about giving people easy pathways, giving them confidence. And we talk a lot about, you know, choose some of the easy things, get some easy wins first, because that will give you the confidence to take those next steps. And also remember, sustainability is not a destination, right? It's a journey. It's it's you know constantly trying to improve. The, the way your organization operates. Um, and don't be worried about not being perfect, right? We don't expect perfection overnight. Um, and also don't be afraid to tell people that you're on this journey. Because what we do know from psychology, if you if you make a promise publicly, you're you're far more likely to stick to it than if you keep the promise to yourself. Mm. And so we always encourage share organizations, people within them to, to be public about their journey. Mm. And, and not be afraid to, to take those first few steps and, and accept that they're not going to become perfectly sustainable, whatever that might be, mm. um, overnight. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very interesting because um, I know for, for the commission in NGA, um, we're going to make sure that there's some recycled stainless, we need to, to push ourselves on recycled stainless steel or, or reclaimed stainless steel. Um, Lindy, now that you are in this journey with us, which is uh, amazing, do you see yourself moving forward to look for recycled bronze, recycled gold, recycled? So do you see your practice revolving to that? And, and I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's a, because I know as a, as a, it's a journey for, for all of us. Um, have, uh, um, is this something that you think will be something to consider for you in your practice, because um, there's a lot of interlinks, like what you said. Yeah, look, it's already in my practice anyway. So yeah. it's not, I, I not just use steel and and uh, those kinds of materials, but I often use um, decayed pieces of, of, of junk or, or wood. Or, and I actually fold in uh, the ideas of, of disintegration and atrification in some of the works. So, you know, the idea of, of cycles of things and how things are maintained or sustained rather, um, it's, it's always been part of my thinking anyway. So, um, uh, anyway, there's even an economy of marks that I've yeah. not so much invented, but there's a sort of system and it's all about not wasting them and, you know, yeah. even a mark, you know. Yeah. So, but I, I think that I'm what I'm excited about is that, you know, this this could have been, this, you know, is a private passion, you know, like just one individual, me, who's just, whose work is trying to address certain things. But working with UAP, you know, a very large uh, actual global company is willing to really help me on this journey. I mean, that's what makes the difference because, because we together, you know, we are actually going to do this journey together. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be successful and it's just going to pave the way it, it's 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 just you know it's going to sneak in 
and people will just start thinking about it and that mm. will become normal. And I think that's mm. what we're aiming for. So, so we just immediately, we always, it's the journey that Chris is talking about. You know, we are always folding in our understanding of what's sustainable because things change all the time. Mm. And we have to, it's a continuous, that's this circle thing. We're always, we're, it's not static. And it's not just linear. It's 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 this circularity. We always have to come back to first principles and of how we interconnect. That's, I, I like the kind of I, I love that this is going to be the normal. I think that's the exact principle and philosophy of the future normal. Green. This is the future normal. I think it's it's a, a, a interesting lady that you you've mentioned that. Um, um, I have a couple of questions, and I, I want I want to start first. Uh, it's a common question for 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 everyone. Do we think that the art world will be ever become sustainable? Do we, uh, Nick, Chris, maybe you want to start? I just because I mean, I read an article. They said that the art world will uh, never me, be, will yeah, never I be wanna, sustainable. So I think it's. it's I want to I want to build on that. Um, so in my in my own work, and let's, it builds on the journey that we've talked about. It builds on the cycles that Lindy's talking about. The simple answer to that is no. We will get better and better and better. But the world is so complex. The interconnections will never fully understand. So consequently, when we solve one problem we will always create in the solving of that problem new problems mm. and so the answer the simple answer is sustainability is a destination that will never be reached but we will keep getting that i would hope that the the arc of history will bend towards ever more sustainable outcomes um, and we will, um, through the application of knowledge and better understanding of the interconnections, we will get better and better at this. But we have to recognize that we will never fully understand it all. And as a consequence, those bits that we don't understand will always come back and be problems for us. So mm -hmm. it's a journey we'll never, it's a journey. It's actually, I would actually, I, I'm less of a journey kind of language person. I'm more of a way person. It's a way. The, the way we've got to move is a way forward with a sustainable mindset and continue to apply that. So. Mm. It, it has to be, you know, embedded into our mindset. It's just sort of something, it's almost as simple as, you know, these days we, we separate our garbage, you know, like it's a really yeah. simple thing. But, you know, when I was growing up, everything went into the same bin. You never took out bottles yeah. or anything like this. But now, you know, it, it's just that you do this and it's normal. So you know, I agree. We are we we're, we're never going to reach perfect sustainability because that's not the that's not the nature of being human, by the way. Mm. But what we are going to reach is a greater consciousness about what's required to look after each other and the planet. And so it just becomes like just as we've learned to separate the plastic bottles out of the food waste, we just immediately kind of think, okay, so what is the the cost of this? Not just in terms of dollar costs but the cost to broader things mm. and that's what art is about too art is actually about the the investigation and the um of of the things that are really invisible in our culture yeah. the things that you know that that need to come out to to be because we we kind of kind of wipe swipe them away a bit mm. so art brings these questions out mm. that's, that's really um, important can I, can I just build on what lynn lindy said Two things there. Lindy, the, the things we talk about in our work when we're talking with um, businesses and with students about business theory and the like is one of the things we talk about is care. And you mentioned care, care for each other. And so that's that's great to hear. And the other thing we talk about is the myopia, which really is the, the short-sightedness that we have with so much of what we do with our organizations and our strategies. And we also talk about that myopia as about another way of bring, making the invisible more visible. So you use that mm. language too. I just wanted to kind of <laughs> say that was great to hear because it's exactly the kind of things we, we talk about. And Chris, do you want to add to that? Um, do you want to add something about if art will or won't be sustainable? 
Look, I, I, yeah, I, in some ways it's not the right question. I, I don't think there is, as we've all said about, there is this end point of which can be sustainable. Um, but I think where art can can really play a role is in the conversations it can spark, right? And, and I think the the sector or, or the industry has this, this amazing ability to connect with so many different people. So I think it's a really important, important element of that sustainable journey or way um, because of its ability to reach so many. And, and you know already, Gilbert, with the work we're doing at UAP, that the, the conversations you start having, they, they flow in all directions. They flow back to the, the people who are supplying you. They, they, supply, they, they flow to the artists and the way they conceptualise and design projects. And then they they flow towards the, the sort of the end user, if you like, the people who who see, appreciate, and interpret, and, and have conversations about the art. So I think the the sector is is, is critical in that that journey towards mm. a, a more sustainable way. That's great, and I think with that, um, it's it's very exciting about these questions. And uh, um, I remember. Uh, when we started our uh, One Earth journey, it's all about us, how UAP become future normal. And um, it's about how do we become fit for the 21st century, um, thinks of 100% well-being and sees money as um, uh, a, 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 a way, not, not as a means, not an end, right? So having all of these discussions is very interesting. And um, we're very lucky that we have partners um, and good friends like like all of you who challenge us to do it. I think it's it's all about also like what Lindy said. It's a journey. It's a risk. Um, we also we, it hasn't been done. Whatever we're doing now, it hasn't been done. So what we would hope to do is we become a case study of success that art becomes sustainable. And I think that is um, uh, I think there is an opportunity for us, and it's it's good to have this journey with with everyone. Um, hello to everyone. It's so weird seeing your face on our pre-recording, but um, I saw some chat messages and it's great to just have those conversations and really just, um, it is, it's an important topic and it's always interesting to see what are the points of view of everybody and it's something that's new. Who would have thought that we will be able to understand what comes in on a certain product or, or especially the artwork, right? So I think there's always a, there's a big question on sustainability. And I guess um, there are a few questions in the chat and one of it would be, um, we wanna ask Lindy a question on, can artists become a voice or an active player for sustainability or sustainable, sustainable development? How do you see artists becoming that active voice on sustainability? Um, I think that's a two two part answer. Um, I was just thinking that you know there are some artists, and I I've actually supervised. You know, I'm thinking of two artists I know in Sydney, um, Kath Fries and Del Walker, and they Del's work particularly. She she addresses you know um, uh, the waste and the rubbish. So all of her work actually incorporates that. So it's actually her subject matter. So it's, some artists will take that up. Kath, the other artists like Kath Fries will take up um, the, the integration of, you know, of human world and natural world. So this becomes the, you know, so that's the content. So that's that part. But the, also the other part is that just um, while sustainability as subject matter isn't at the heart of my work, I can request people like UAP to, to try to turn the ship around to, to manufacture, to help me fabricate what, things in a way that is sustainable. And I think that's the beginning of the journey for me in, in this understanding this process. And I think what's been, you know, like the conversations that UAP and I have had are really about, you know, the, the big sculptures that I'm about to make, um, they're going to be, um, every single ingredient of them will be measured for their impact. And that's the beginning of actually trying to understand what we do and, and the impact of it. So I think it's a, it's a two-pronged question. So some people wonderfully will, will make that the subject matter of their work and there's that. And then other artists can just, just you know, say, well, you know, the way in which we do things should be sustainable as well. 
That's good. And this might sound weird because I'm going to ask a question to Mark. Mark put a very interesting comment on there when he says, my art has always been sustainable. Hi, Mark. Um, I want to understand that when you say my art has always been sustainable, do you mean you've measured carbon emissions to it or how, how, how have you been? I think it would be good to get, just get your thoughts on that because it, it's part of the conversation that we want here. So it's the community of voices. So I think um, it would be good to get a sense from you also. How have you been doing your practice to be sustainable? And sorry for putting you on the spot. No, that's okay. I hope you can hear me. Yes. You <clears throat> okay. Um, I am a 60 year old man. I developed neuropathy. I'm a type one diabetic. I cannot go back to my regular job, which was transportation. Normally throughout the decades I've lived, I've always been an artist. I've had straight, straight A's in art, dabbled with silk screen, painting, uh, watercolor, whatever. I found a little niche, which is my corrugated box art. And, you know, it's quite seriously, it happened while I was uh, one day taking my trash out and I ripped open some boxes and I, I, I seen this fluted medium in there. And I thought, wow, kinetically, this thing is visually appealing. <clears throat> you know, did I want it to be a business? Um, I, 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 you know, gosh, who in the heck doesn't want to be like Andy Warhol or, or whomever, you know? Um, but, you know, I found a, a niche for it. And I started selling my art to corrugated ma manufacturers and those in the recycling business and those that you know, green entities, green businesses, that we were taking something that I was actually literally throwing out as trash and repurposing it to create some very cool sculpture. And I've kept myself afloat. You know, I have two kids, a wife of 32 years. I'm, 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 I'm not this person that's like looking, you know, at the great end, you know, wow, you know, can we make some money at this? But yes, I do. <clears throat> I do have some awesome clients and I've worked very, very hard at this for almost 20 friggin' years. And, but it does carry a sustainable message because it, it allows people to uh, rethink what they throw in the trash. Mm. Uh, corrugated is the number one recycled material on the planet. Glass, aluminum cans, blah. Corrugated paper comes from trees. It's biodegradable. I use non-toxic glue. I use oak, which is sustainably grown. Um, but you know, I don't, I, 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 you know, I think my, my carbon footprint, you know, to use that buzzword, which I frigging hate using because I don't consider myself a green artist, but you know, by default, by default, um, I happen to be, and it's really cool because you know what little kids get into this stuff that I do. I have, uh, students like in the UK that are actually reaching out and they're discovering my artwork and you know what it's something simple what what do you do with all those Amazon boxes you have right and um I don't know yeah uh, a, a lot of people and I'll, I'll, I'll end here a lot of people view my art as um less than quality because it was trash but I I try to use as virgin materials as I can some of my clients actually ship me products, so it's not all about dumpster diving. But uh, I've been doing this for a, a long time. Yeah. And um, it's, it, that's why I joined this group today, because I wanted to kind of hear that, what's going on. That, that's that's you know, good. I have a lot of experience with it. And that's all, you know. And, yeah, no, I think that's, that's exactly where... When we started about this ordering ingredient list, it's exactly the same purpose that you wanted to achieve, Mark. It's about just understanding how we can really evolve and be more responsible when it comes to production and consumption, which I think I want to just ask quickly, Nick and Chris, like, what do you think would be the challenges of artists or any organization in the creative industry 
who wants to reinforce or create practices to be sustainable. Because I know we've done research in the past as part of One Earth, wherein they are saying that art will never be or will not be sustainable. But I guess, what do you think will be the challenges? Um, and Nick and Chris, you, any of you would, 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 would answer it. Yeah, hi, hi, Gilbert. Thanks, thanks for that. And Mark, just been uh, Googling some of your work. Um, incredible, amazing, the, the things you can do with, with corrugated um, cardboard. It looks, looks amazing. Uh, in, in terms of the, in terms of the challenge, and look, I'll, I'll keep, I'll keep probably coming back to this, and it, it we will repeat some of the things that were said in the video. Was the biggest challenge is getting started, right? I mean, it is so easy just to keep doing what you've always done and, and do it in the same way. Um, but we're now very much at a point in terms of our journey as a species on this planet of, of not being able to continue to do things the way we've always done them. So I, I think. For, for, art, for artists, for the industry, for the sector, the biggest challenge is, is getting started. And I think the second biggest challenge is that once you begin to, to, on this journey is not to be overwhelmed. And, and again, I made the point in the, in the video earlier that it's really important to identify small steps, easy wins, you know, realize that we're not expecting um, a complete change overnight. You're not, you're not going to become 100% on the, you know, sustainable overnight. But it's important to start the journey and, and not to be discouraged. We keep making those those small steps. Um, and I was talking to Nick before, and he was saying, "But you, you always say small steps." And I'm saying, "Well, I always say it because I I believe it. I think it's I think it's definitely part of the journey." And I think we've we reflected that with you guys, Gilbert and UAP. It's about you know incremental progress towards. Um, yeah, a, a way of being sustainable. Nick, do you want to add something to that? And I guess uh, a good follow-up to that question is um, uh, because we know that artwork ingredients list is something that is um, what we want to do is we want to share those learnings with other artists and, and galleries or commissioners. What do you think would be, how will, what will make it successful really? Thanks. Thank you for asking the question and thanks Mark and thanks Chris. Yeah, Chris, you do always say small steps and I always say mindset. Um, <clears throat> hi everyone. Um, in terms of um, making this kind of thing successful, I think it's I think it's a good chunk of awareness. It's certainly awareness in terms of and we're seeing the change in um, publics around the, the world wanting to be uh, more aware you know climate change is in the vanguard at the moment um, but being more aware generally of where things come from how did they get here what was involved there's been initiatives throughout the years um, fair trade modern slavery that have tried to go at this and i think you know i think it, it's an obvious point perhaps is it's very difficult for us to fully appreciate something and fully value something if we don't know what actually went into it and this is what the ingredients list idea is trying to do is trying to say well this is actually what this cost i think i said that in the video um and what will make it successful i think is um building on chris's small steps um uh, people starting to embrace it it's both in terms of the buying public but also in terms of uh, the artists that will be on this call um, and then the far, final piece i probably want to add is it's got to continually evolve um, this may go a little bit to the journey we were talking about in the video, but um, we're talking and working with you at the moment, Gilbert, about you know, materials and carbon, but um, we've talked about how do we then take this to a better understanding of, of the full energy input, a better understanding of the ecological footprint, a better understanding of the water footprint. So I think these things have all got to continually evolve through time. But to summarize it, I think it would be awareness um, and build the continual building of awareness will make it successful. Awareness and e evolution. Cool. And what really excites me is in this call now, we have like from Australia to the United States and to the UK, we have everyone who are really in interested to make the art industry to become sustainable and have a really strong voice to sustainable development. 
And I guess the question that I have is for Lindy, because we know we've been, we, we are doing this um, as, a, as a case study also. And um, we saw your work, Lindy, in public art worldwide, and now with, with NGA, and we've seen a lot of like different stages of material exploration. Um, and it gives us uh, a lot of like distinct meaning and voice and insight um, is there anything um, that is uh, what you think is going to be the future of your practice moving forward? And really, what's next um, um, moving forward? Oh, uh, well, I, you know, I think there's a lot that's happening. I mean, I think that the, the two main, two very large projects that I'm doing, one for Hong Kong and one for the NGA, they're both going to be, um, I think they're pioneers really, because they, they're really going to be, uh, their impact is going to be recorded. And so just moving on because UAP and Lindy Lee have agreed to make this something that we're going to carry onwards. I mean, I think that's really exciting because I think I was talking to the director of UAP, Dan Tobin, and you know he's, he's really wanting UAP itself to become um, sustainable and that's fantastic. Um, in terms of my work, I mean it's just that I um, I love Mark's comments about you know materiality is really important like the materiality of that corrugated cardboard. It means so many things you know because we um, like one of my one of my uh, students who was working with garbage, you know, and what she was discovering was that um, things, you know, objects in the world, materials in the world accrue meaning. You know, we, we know the color red because of the color of the sunset. You know, you know we know that this is um, junk because it's been disposed of. I mean, materials accumulate meaning. And I think that's one of, and so I think that what Mark is doing, and I haven't had a chance to see your work online, but I will, um, is just that, you know, it's bringing attention to this materiality. And, you know, what I really love about, and what I think is important about art is that art presents us with, um, let's say objects that cause curiosity and, ex and an experience. And that mm -hmm. experience then causes a question. You know, that's the best thing about art. And art, you know, and then that's its afterlife. Mark is going like this, yeah. So art has this afterlife that resonates. So people get these experiences, they open, experiences you know, questions and then you carry these questions around with you and it it sparks it's this ripple effect and I think that's you know one of the secret things of what art does um and it can't be underestimated and materiality is very much to the point in this discussion no that's that's a, uh, I want to ask uh, thanks Lindy that's a that's a um a, a, I would agree with Mark absolutely. Um, there's a question which I think it's going to be um, uh, important to ask. Um, it's from Lee. Um, I think Lee Wen um, just asked it. For young practices that are just engaging with sustainable practices, where should they start given the overload of information? I think that's a good question. And Nick, Chris, or Lindy, uh, um, feel free to to answer that question. So, if, for someone who is starting emerging artists, how do they start with sustainable practices? It, for me, I think it's just um, as uh, I think both Nick and Chris said, you just don't get overwhelmed. You know, it's it's a very being an artist or being you know, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with the hugeness of our problems. And I think for that young artist, first of all he, she has made the right, the first step and has, has asked that question. So that's the first step. And then of course, you know, I'm very simple about these things. You just, you meet, I am so simple. You just meet with that reaction and connection in your heart. And that, because that's caused some curious curiosity to you, that's caused you a question. And that question is gonna lead you to, the, to discover the materials, the meaning, um, all things, lots of things are going to, to come up just because of that first honest and open question uh, that allows the world into you um, and to connect. And that is where your subject is, just saying. Nick, Chris, do you wanna add something to that? 
I guess, yeah, to follow up on, on what Lindy said, you know, you're already on that journey just by asking this question, just by being in, in, in this forum. Mm. Um, so in terms of sort of practical next steps, I, I think it would be about trying to understand the things that go into production of your art and what happens to your art after it leaves your studio. And, and simply trying to map that process on a, on a big piece of butcher's paper, then that will allow you to identify perhaps some easy things where you can reduce impact. So that would be my, my first practical step. That's great. It's, it's very simple, but actually that is very true. Like I remember asking uh, UAP's carbon footprint, it's a simple request, but that's one of the most difficult thing. And it's a lot of us, I'm sure most of us here now in the call have questioned what is our impact in this world? And it's a good question to ask ourselves actually, and the organizations that we were working for. And, and a lot of us would have very a faint question or like answers to it. And it's good to just answer that personally and in an organizational level. So.